Hey guys, welcome to Social 545. My name is Saba. I'm one of your co-hosts and we're joined today by Roberto Blake. Welcome, Roberto. Hey, how's it going, you guys? Hey, welcome to Social 545, Roberto. We're really excited to have you. And for those of you that are watching us here on Blab, thanks for tuning in. And if you are listening to us on iTunes, we appreciate the love. Now, Roberto Blake is a YouTube Thought leader, do I dare call him an expert? We were just talking about this on the pre-show, and Roberto is going to bring it because we were just talking about how you define subject matter experts and thought leaders today. But let me tell you guys this. Roberto was recently featured by Forbes around how he has grown his YouTube presence to over 60,000 followers over the last two years. He's amazing. His moniker is Create Awesome. And he happens to create videos on YouTube every single day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. So we're really excited to have Roberto Blake here on Social 545. It's going to be a good be conversation. Yeah, All right, so let's listening. get started. Let's get started and kind of take a deep dive into really why you have been so successful. And obviously some people might attribute it to the fact that you put out so much content, you're so consistent with your content, you've been doing it for a few years now, but tell us, let's start, what do you think has been the number one contributor to your success? I think it's something that um, people really take for granted is that I know why I'm here and I'm authentic. And I know that the authenticity is a big buzzword right now, but what I'll qualify with that is that in talking about creative services and helping people create awesome, I'm talking to people who are designers, regardless of what age or background that they're coming from. And at the same time, I'm also talking to marketers. I'm talking about business people. I'm talking about tech people. And you know, to get them to take you seriously is not necessarily an easy thing to do. There's so much information out there. YouTube's so saturated that people are skeptical of everything. So I think that leading with my strongest punches was the key. I started with tutorials and I started showing people how to do something in Photoshop and making it as clear to them as possible. And then I started talking about the principles behind that and showing my face. So I was authentic. I was real. And I was answering people's questions. and I was consistent in the comments. I think all that stuff adds up, but I also knew why I was there. I was there to help people. Then it would and show them how to do something. Then I moved to informing them of the principles and the thoughts that go behind that and what the career is like, what the real world is like, what things I went through and struggled through in the hopes that I can make their journey a little easier. So I understood the philosophy behind my brand and it was consistent not only inside of YouTube, but I was a blogger before that, answering people's questions in email, interviewing other creative professionals on my blog for, for years. Um, helping students, helping people who were transitioning in their career. So I brought that same level of authenticity, that same personal respect to my YouTube channel. And then I was just me. I didn't say, you know what, I'll get a haircut so that people take me seriously. I didn't put on a suit and tie for people to like take me seriously and respect me. It's no disrespect to anyone who does that and that's who they are in their brand. The minute that I got really good with YouTube was the minute that I made and put on these Create Awesome shirts, my Kango hat, and just rolled with it. The fact that I will have whatever like sci-fi show or comic book that I'm into right now up on my desktop in the middle of a YouTube video where I'm talking business, that I will sit here and I will have action figures on my desk and not care. People are able to see that I'm authentic, I'm real, and I'm not trying to oversell myself to them as some kind of expert or influencer that I'm going to tell you information, take it or leave it, execute on it, and tell me what's not working for you, and I'll try and help. You know, so, you know, Roberto, this culture that is that of YouTube, I've seen it really evolve over the last couple of years. You know, a good friend of mine, Phil O'Reilly, and his girlfriend, Melissa Trippi, who's uh, the sister of Charles Trippy, really notable vlogger. Um, they really opened up my eyes to this, this culture, right? The vlogging, the daily vloggers, people right. of mass influence. Talk to us about that world. So we know about Twitter, we know about the Facebooks, but talk to us about the essence of YouTube. Why has that blown up to be as big of a community as it is today? I can't remember who it was at a conference that I heard who put it best, 
Um, I really wish I could uh, credit him and put his name out there because it was a great talk. But he uses this phrase, people are interesting and everything else isn't. YouTube came from uh, having a tagline called broadcast yourself. And I totally believe in them. And that's true. I think that people underestimate the power of human connection mm -hmm. and that we really do want to see like people's everyday lives. When people whine and complain about people doing food selfies instead of eating their food first and everything like that, I get it because they should be living. He's talking to you, Saba. <laughs> I know. I, I was love, thinking about myself. <laughs> I love food selfies. Do you know why? Because first of all, one, I can be pissed at my friend for saying, you're at that restaurant without me right now. Why didn't mm -hmm. I get a call? What the heck, man? I can do that. You know I love sushi. Why am I not there? Um, and then I know, well, wait a minute. Now I know that I really want that sushi. Now I want to know that I'm going to that restaurant or, oh, wow, I haven't seen you crack that bottle of wine open before. I want that. And now that business, that brand just got free marketing from someone sharing their life with me. Instead of waiting two weeks for them to mail me a postcard from Hawaii, I can see it right now. I can be there and be jealous right now. Right. It's like, so those things matter. So YouTube means that I have a window into the life of somebody else's experiences. And then I can extrapolate what I might want for myself in my life. And in my journey, I can watch other people's career and their journey. I can watch like the, and I can also experience a real human moment from them and then use it to like understand myself better. I actually watch Casey Neistat stuff a lot, not mm -hmm. because I want to be Casey Neistat or I want to be like a YouTube vlogger. That's not my thing. But the reason I vlog on Sundays is mm -hmm. because I think that there's something in context of saying, this is why I struggled with in my career, or even this is why I'm struggling with right now as a creative business owner. It's hard. Or, hey, like I've done all this work. I have all this social proof. I have all these legitimate results. I have all these clients that I've worked with that will say X, Y, Z. And then I still have to take crap from some anonymous person in a YouTube comment. What the heck? Being able to speak to that and show real human vulnerability, it matters to people who follow you because now they become an emotionally investment. We get right. emotionally invested and then that leads to a pragmatic decision that we're rationalizing. So that's so why how is that it's so big. How does that differ though from Blab, which we're on now, or Meerkat or Periscope or any of these live stream platforms? Because I totally get the authenticity and just being real and being able to see people in the moment. So how does YouTube differ from that? The backbone of search and then archival and then intent. What most people, even some of our friends, don't realize about every platform is the phrase that you know me and Amy and mm -hmm. Gary, we always talk about context of platform, context of platform, but there's also context of user intention. Meaning that when I see a YouTube video, I didn't stumble across it. I searched for something specific and this was what was recommended to me. And then out of all of the options, I made a choice. When Blab happens, it's kind of like walking through the mall or coffee shop and saying, oh, well, that's interesting. Oh, well, that's interesting. There's not intent. You can, we've done it before. We've stumbled from Blab to Blab to Blab to Blab before uh, based on, oh, I see some people over there and oh, I see who's talking or oh, my friends are there. So I'll go to that restaurant or go to that club versus YouTube is, just about you it's about mm -hmm. your specific intention right periscope a lot of times it's also that you're getting a notification of someone i've opted into already someone i care about just did mm -hmm. something and i can be there for it right now and i can ask a question blab is i can get face to face i can have a conversation mm -hmm. youtube is conversational in the comments but the backbone of it is i'm trying to solve this problem today it leads to one of the things that i love to talk about that i get beat up about that no one understands about my youtube strategy mm -hmm. You guys want to hear this nugget? Yeah, absolutely. Tell us, tell us not only the nugget, but we want to know about your YouTube strategy, how you got to over 60,000 subscribers. So the largest criticism that I take from people is that you have 65,000 subscribers. So why does this video have a thousand views? Why does this video have 5,000 views? Why are not more of your viewers watching your content? Oh, is it because you diversified your content? Why don't you focus on niche? You'd be such a bigger YouTuber, which is crap. It's true mm -hmm. that those things would probably work, but it's crap because that's not my plan. My plan was never, and I mean never, to be a big YouTuber. I do have a plan for how to leverage 100,000 subscribers as a legacy goal and as a narrative that leads to other things and to know personally that I helped 100,000 people execute on something in their lives. How many people get to do that? 
My mm -hmm. entire YouTube channel is about executing on things and learning things and motivating and educating yourself to do something, to take action. Meaning that if a thousand people in a month or in a week watch that video, then that means that there's a thousand people mm -hmm. that had to solve that one problem today. I'm not an mm -hmm. entertainer trying to get ratings. So it means that a thousand people viewing were the right thousand people. A thousand people have that problem. It's not about a thousand people giving a crap about me. It's about giving a crap about themselves to execute on this one thing. So a thousand people may not need to know about YouTube SEO or how to use tags or titles that day, but they might need to know how to do this one thing in Photoshop or their boss is going to crush them or their mm -hmm. client is going to move on to someone else. And so my YouTube strategy is to build an archive and library of content around the things that I have experiences in so that those people, mm -hmm. whether they're just starting out or they're doing something new, and it's not just if you're a designer, it's not just if you're a YouTuber, it's not just if you're somebody who's into camera gear. You might be a small business owner that today needs to figure out, I got a camera, for Christmas, mm -hmm. I can use this to grow my business. I see all this Instagram stuff going on and my camera has wireless. How do I use that? Roberto has a video, cool. Oh, you know mm -hmm. what? Roberto helped me on five other things that I was trying to do for my business. I'll go to his video or, okay, I got Roberto's video, but you know what? I need more context here. I'm mm -hmm. gonna reach out to him for consulting. I had someone on a video based on my rental of a Sony A7R II 4K mirrorless camera from Sony that I borrowed from Lumoid to do uh, some reviews and sample videos. I had a $200 an hour consult with someone who spent $4,000 on this camera and a lens who was going to go overseas and do some shooting and wanted to know how to use it better. And I walked them through the specific context of his situation. Instead of a generalized video, he got one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one time and then was able to get the shots of a lifetime because he decided I'm gonna invest in learning that thing from somebody that I trust and like I use the camera, like Roberto's results were better than mine. What did he do differently? It's really interesting, right? Because I think so many people have this impression of YouTube that everyone is on YouTube to get a million views, right? How can you get that one viral video that's gonna change your, um, I guess your perception in this online world, right? How can I go from that? It was 5,000 subscribers to 10,000. And it's interesting to hear you kind of talk through your strategy because it is so specific and so pinpointed. And you're not saying, I wanna make sure that all my videos get 20,000 views, right? Because of anything, you have so much content and there's so much detail that people can go look for exactly what they want to do. And so what would you tell someone who is kind of trying to figure out their strategy, right? So you've done a really great job, but there's a lot of people out there who haven't been able to figure it out. And because of that lack of focus, they don't get the su subscribers that they're looking for, right? So what would be sort of some advice that you would give out? It's actually something that I'm trying to address a lot more in the channel. And it's Great. something I'm trying to address specifically in the free email course that I started for people to not only put out some of my best content to them in a lesson format, because my the problem with YouTube is the lack of structure, which is great about Udemy and Linda courses and things like that. But I wanted to create a free resource of like the best stuff to say, okay, go in this order and focus on these things. But then I add text in there to give more context and more depth. But what I will say that is that it comes down to um, – w5h which is the five w's and then how so start with why which is also a great book by simon Sinek. you know that mm -hmm. everyone should read uh but you start with why why are you on youtube one why should someone subscribe to your channel why should someone watch this video so that's the why what do they get out of it what do you get out of it what do you get out of having a thousand subscribers? Is that ego? Is that self gratification? Is it motivation to keep going? In which case I would tell someone to reevaluate this because those aren't big enough what's for my taste personally. Uh, I think you need a bigger goal. I think that all the big YouTubers that they're following had a bigger goal. So it's mm -hmm. what do you want to get out of a thousand subscribers? What do you want to get out of 10,000 subscribers? Look, like not that people should try to make a living off of YouTube because I think that if you're not a business person, you can't unless you're very fortunate or you have a dynamic personality where you would have been successful in traditional media anyway. Like some of the YouTube personalities we know, they would have been successful. Some of them are scaling into traditional media because they would have been successful at that anyway. But 
I would say that you have to have a big enough what. What do you want to get out of this? And then more importantly, yeah. what does the viewer get out of your channel? What do they get out of each video? What are they here for? And that has to be very clear. When you go to a lot of people's YouTube channel, you have no idea. They say, oh, come watch my channel or subscribe to my channel. And they, it's like, why should I be here? And what do I get out of it? Right? And so that's a big problem. So the, even businesses have that problem. They know what they want. They know what their right hook is. They know I want to sell mm -hmm. more office supplies, but they don't. But what does the user get out of it? Don't I didn't come here to watch an office supply commercial. You know who did it really well? Home Depot. Home Depot mm -hmm. did videos that showed you how to install a door or rain gutters, and now you know that Home Depot has an interest in solving your problem, and you know that Home Depot has all the tools you need, and they've shown you how to actually use that thing. I would love for a brand, if I could like go to a QR code on my phone, and I know marketers hate on QR codes, but it's because marketers in America screwed it up overseas they do it fantastic i would love every time i buy a piece of furniture to snap a qr code and see a two minute or three minute youtube video on how to assemble this thing so i don't have to screw it up put it back into the back box perfectly and say hey you guys gave me a defective thing right i would love yeah. that because i suck at putting together my shelves okay so it's about what does the person get context where else can they get to you to get to this content that makes sense People spam Twitter and they Twitter bomb their videos to people who have no need of them. People spam Facebook groups with their videos with no story behind. If you're trying to execute on this, this video will help you. So it's about where do you pull people from? You can pull people from a blog that you've built up that gave you a good reputation for solving those problems and it gives you a second opportunity to rank in Google search. You can pull people from a Facebook group where you're an, an influencer in that group and you've been proving consistent value and you've been helping people solve their problems, not just marketing yourself to them. And so you can put a video there. Carlos, we're in a lot of Facebook groups together. Mm -hmm. Do I ever post anything without giving context as to who it's useful for? I got to say that you are one of the more engaged marketers out there. And, and we're going to get to titles here in a minute. We were talking about in the pre-show, someone like Roberto, do we label you a social media marketer? Do we label you a YouTube expert, expert? So we'll get to that. But I have to say that you are consistent. You brought up consistency earlier as being something that you really focus on. And I have to say, so, so I run a group on Facebook, social media masterminds group, and you know, Roberto's in that always looking for ways to add value. That's the name of the game, right? You're not on social media just to sell stuff. At least you shouldn't be, you should be using social media, to build relationships at scale. And how do you do that? It's by adding value to the greater ecosystem. So I can attribute that. And, you know, I was just looking at your YouTube channel now and your headline is always be creating and sub headlines, seven days a week of videos, helping you create awesome. So, so here's a guy and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and pitch you for a second, Roberto. Here's a guy who has a YouTube channel that is devoted. You brought Home Depot before you're like the Home Depot of YouTube, if I can say that. So here's a guy who every single day is dropping a new video around graphic design. If you want to be a graphic designer, how do you do that? How do you start up a graphic design business? You know, you've obviously carved out a niche for yourself, which is teaching others and inspiring others to be awesome, as you call it. So for that, I've got to tip my hat off to you because that's, that's something that the consistency piece, I think, is where people whether it's social media marketing, YouTubing, what have you, even just in their own lives where they fall, they fall off the tracks, right? It's hard to be amazingly consistent. So for you to do this every single day, man, it's just really a testament to, to the hard work that you put in. And again, I see you all over Facebook, but not saying, Hey, come visit me, come watch my videos. It's always you looking for ways to give back to others. That's the way it should be. Exactly. Yeah. And like, I think it's, it's part of my true narrative, which everyone has to find, which I've mentioned. Um, I think you've read my book, um, the free mini guide that I give to my email list, the seven points of personal branding. I talk about the fact consistency, but you know what? It's not just consistency and execution. We talk a lot about execution. Like Saba, you and I had a conversation about this too, like philosophical consistency. Who are you? Who are you here to serve? Who are you trying to connect with? Who creates value for you? Who do you create value for? You know, what are you here to do? Why are you doing it? Where can people access you? Where are you comfortable being? What do you really want to do? How are you getting there? 
how are people getting value from you? How are you getting value from them? It's that's why I say it's like the the five W's plus H for how. And like I think that being philosophical, look, create awesome is not just something on a shirt and on a sign here. It is my philosophy. It's what do I do? Create awesome things and share them with the world and help educate and motivate other people to do the same. Why? You know, it was done for me. Yeah, one thing I was going to say, it's interesting. When you were talking about sort of how you figured out your strategy, one thing was sort of a mental shift that I think a lot of people on social kind of lack, right? So your mentality is how can I provide value to them, right? And although people always say that, they always feel like people owe them something, right? Like, why didn't you subscribe? Why didn't you comment? And although they're trying to provide quote unquote value, they don't actually feel like their audience should be doing something for them, right? So it's a really interesting shift. And so a lot of times people are like, why aren't I getting these followers? Why aren't people engaging? And it's like, because you're not actually being authentic, right? And like you said, you're actually creating something every day and you're providing this value without expecting anything in return. And we've talked about this, right? So even if you had, I mean, I mean, you've been doing this for so long and doing such a great job, like Carlos said, the Home Depot of YouTube, and you have 67,000 subscribers. But I think you would be talking with the same amount of passion and knowledge if you had 12 subscribers. But I think I the next person- I was when I got comfortable just with talking in front of the camera. I got better, and it wasn't because of my subscriber count. It was because I was doing it more, and that wasn't even because of the subscriber count in and of itself. It was because I was in a position to do it more and it was also learning. It was that I didn't go to doing seven weeks, uh, seven days a week of content right off the bat. Some people do that. I didn't. I started with being consistent one day a week and figuring that out. And I was often late. And like for the holidays, I've been like one day behind my usual schedule, but I think I just caught up. But you know, that's the holidays, but I shoot stuff in advance now and I shoot stuff in bulk now. So a lot of people, one, they think I'm a full-time YouTuber because I'm doing seven days a week of content. I started doing seven days a week of content with a couple of strategies in mind, and it was not specifically to grow subscribers. I thought that that would happen, but I wanted to be able to do a case study. I wanted to be able to do a case study of what doing 500 YouTube videos in X amount of time looks like. What does a year mm -hmm. to two years of daily content, what does that look like for a business or a brand and what's achievable there? And then from a production and editing and promotional standpoint, is that sustainable? Is that scalable? And what would the impact be? And I wanted to know that as a marketer. I wanted to know that as a producer. I wanted to know that as an editor, what editing like that is like so that I can talk to people in Premiere Pro who are Adobe people so I could talk to Adobe about it and what the challenges are and say, hey, in the Adobe forms, look, I'm doing this every day and I need this feature or this is my problem. The speed of getting to be able to do that from the understanding of being that consistent, it's why on-the-job training makes you fast. Mm -hmm. Being consistent and showing up every day in YouTube meant that I learned every feature and every tool and every nuance of the platform. And most people who are, I want more subscribers, uh, how do I get big in YouTube? They haven't even learned how to use a fraction of the tools that YouTube has available for free. They're like, how do I get copyright free music? YouTube has a music library right there in the creative studio with sound effects that you can use for free, royalty free and monetized. They have music that you can use royalty free and monetized right there. How I don't have editing software. YouTube has a built in video editor right there and they don't even know that. And it's not learning the platform. It's not respecting the platform and respecting the time it takes to learn it. I've been at YouTube two and a half years working on stuff. But before that, I was a blogger, so I learned SEO and I learned content marketing well before that. I was a web designer before that, a graph designer, so I understood visual presentation matters. So when YouTube custom thumbnails came out, I was like, okay, cool. I can use my Photoshop skills. Oh, YouTube channel artwork, cool. I'll use my, you saw my YouTube channel. You saw that, oh, here's a header. And what I do, I tell you, seven days, oh, you go to the YouTube channel, it's super subscribable now. Seven days a week of creating, awesome. Always be creating, wow, that's really motivational and like, is he doing that? And then, oh, sure hmm. enough. And then, oh, wait, 500, 600 videos? What, what? And so hmm. then it's authority and authenticity of practice what you preach of, oh, can you? And then that's social proof even as a marketer to say, yeah, I'm going to tell you about video marketing. Oh, our company doesn't have time. 
so I'm going to out hustle your entire marketing department. Cause I did like 500 videos this year, Jack, like, you know, you guys can't do 30 and then market them very well. So you were a graphic designer before you've been on YouTube now, two and a half years, you're 600 videos in what has this done for your personal brand? A lot of things, a lot of things. So the interesting thing is that if you type a search for graphic design in YouTube, I will be on that first page multiple times. That gives me a lot of leverage. And one of the things it did for me, here's another thing about views and about being the right view. Instead of getting a million views on a tutorial I did for Adobe InDesign, it was one right view that led to a relationship with uh, InDesign Secrets and Creative Pro. The result of that was I ended up writing for Creative Pro. This started scaling my paid writing relationship with other publications that I write for. And while I won't tell you what they pay me per article, what I can say and what I can tell you is that doing a couple of articles a month as a paid writer, I make somewhere between 12 and 15K a year off of writing. That wow. is not very difficult for me to do on subjects that I have proven credibility in partly from YouTube, but then also because it funneled them to seeing that I had a blog where I'd already written like 300 plus articles about these things. So it was instant credibility and leverage there that led to that writing relationship that then mm -hmm. also led, well, you do all these videos and you speak so well, come be a speaker at Pepcon, which launched my speaking career in the summer. And then I got to do like five speaking engagements this year and start my speaking career. I've got five lined up for next year already that are locked in yeah. and then I have more besides, and those are paid speaking engagements. So YouTube did that for my personal brand. It also increased the traffic to my, uh, my blog, my website. I have clients that contact me, whether I accept them as clients or not. I'm actually in, have the luxury on the design side of my practice of turning mm -hmm. away clients because they might not be a good fit. Um, I don't think that um, the project is something in my wheelhouse or it's something that I just don't want to work with or work on just based on it not being philosophically aligned. And I have that luxury where other people, and I refer it to other people who I know can take the work. And the result is I get to work with people that I like all the time when I work mm -hmm. on projects. I get to work for brands that I believe in. And the reality is I even get to work on projects that I can't even show or make public that pay very well because now I'm working at that level where it's like, okay, I can never put that in my portfolio because NDA. And so that's a really right. good place to be. And because YouTube is a funnel for business and for client relationships, it's also a filter because if someone's romantic and respects suit and tie, haircut, and all of those things, we may not get along to work with per se. So the thing is, if they accept me as my authentic, nerdy, out there, artistic, eclectic self with also the filter of my extreme pragmatism, and they can take the fact that, yeah, I'm not going to say yes to everything. I'm not going to be a pair of hands. If I think you're doing it wrong, I'm going to tell you in explicit detail and write a three-page report on how to do it better. <laughs> I was going to I was gonna say, though, don't don't be fooled by the haircut, Okay. <laughs> I can be right just on. as nerdy. Yeah, you go a little rogue, Carlos. So it's like, I'm, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I want to get yeah, to some of like, these questions in the chat sure. only because we've, we've, we've had a lot of what they're getting. We, we have a lot of engaging questions. I want to make sure we address a few of these before we move on to um, some of the mistakes that you see. But we're going to start with uh, Driving Mall, I believe your name is. Uh, he asked, how long does each YouTube video take to make? He said that he talked to a YouTuber in New Zealand. He says about 20 hours. Uh, not for me. It depends on what you're doing. If you were an animator, um, and I'm just going to also answer in the comments here. Um, but if you are an animator, sure. Or if you're someone for whom this is very difficult, maybe. The people that I've taught how to do it, they've cut their time down dramatically because I showed them, okay, here's my workflow in Adobe Premiere. Here's exactly how I make videos. And then also, here's a getting started in Premiere Pro video. I took a friend of mine, um, Latisse, in Atlanta, and I made that tutorial specifically kind of for her because I just walked her on the phone step by step how to make a video for YouTube that she shot with her phone and how to edit it. And so for me, shooting a video that's going to be six minutes takes me eight minutes to shoot 
because I'm comfortable on camera and I don't flub it a lot. I'm a one take Jake, so I can do that. <laughs> that same eight minute video takes me one and a half times the average time of the video, meaning that if it's a if it's a eight minutes to shoot, then it's a six minute video edited down, which means that it takes me approximately maybe 10 to 12 minutes tops probably to edit that video. And in my videos, I'm doing color grading and a fade in and fade out, and that's it. But I'm also tweaking the audio levels and uh, doing adaptive noise reduction. That's my workflow. For some people, that would take them an hour to two hours. For me, but and also you learn this if you watch my tutorial, you can cut that down, but I'm also a practice hand at this. It used to take me longer, but doing YouTube videos every day for X amount of time, and that doesn't always mean shooting a video every day, mm -hmm. but editing that often, got me faster a couple hundred times a hundred times even of doing something just like sports like you guys remember this and you remember it from school anything you do like a hundred times you're gonna get faster at it you're gonna cut the curve it's not gonna take you the same amount of time as time one so my answer to that is if it's taking you 20 hours you might need a better workflow you might need to use different software you might need to look at a tutorial whether it's mine or someone else's and that will help you get faster at editing but also editing every day will get you faster. Now, disclaimer, I've been doing video editing since I was about 14 or 15 years old anyway. So I already had background, just like with my design. It might take me an hour to do something that might take someone else 20. I showed that with my speed art videos for Photoshop. Uh, I had um, a, a piece of artwork that won 2013 September Photoshop Creator Editor's Choice Award. I, it was a speed art thing that I did for YouTube that took an hour because I gave myself speed art challenges of what can I create on a canvas from scratch in an hour? Because graphic designers need to start learning, even as digital artists, that you need to be able to put together something to show a client for an ad. If you work in an agency, mm -hmm. you don't have the two weeks you had in college. You've got to show five things in one day, which means right. that you've got you know eight hours, the meeting was an hour, and now you still got to crank out five things crap and oftentimes you're not being compensated if you don't have a contract in place or if you're doing it it might be that you are getting compensated but you might have a pitch fee and there's mm -hmm. a different thing and i would have to get into a conversation about agencies we'd have to do another talk on that agencies <laughs> are interesting what's but your what's your advice to people who um you know are beginners don't have the experience you have in terms of what is sort of the bare minimum that they should know in terms of post-production right how important is an intro how important is an outro how important are these little tweaks that you make during post-production that actually affect your viewership and do they and how much effort because i think there's so many ways for people to create excuses for themselves so i'm trying to kind of address some of those and say hey you know even if you don't do that much post-production even if you don't edit out all of your ums and your likes can you still grow your viewership if you have the right strategy and you have the great content in place good question i would tell them to go and reference the first videos of john and hank green the vlog brothers reference okay. the first videos of michelle fawn reference the first videos of marquez brownlee mkbhd these are people with millions of viewers in youtube but if you go back six and seven and eight years to when they got started, also cameras sucked back then, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was watching Hank Green's old stuff, and it was shot practically in a dark room. It might as well have been pitch black. The audio was horrible, and yet it was Hank's interesting slash awkward personality and the fact that he stuck with it and he got better. And same thing with John, because they were not like, – like Hank was a musician and a science nerd, and John – is a writer who overcame depression. Those are interesting and great stories of personal achievement and brands of themselves, but ultimately they also just were talking to people and having a conversation, just like we are on Blab. If you are an interesting enough and unique enough and cool enough person, the people who gravitate to that, just like you, they would naturally in real life, will stick around and your production values won't matter. But I would also say with a phone today and the $20 lapel mic that I use on my videos, this is a $20 – I'm not even using the $80 Rode um, video mic that most of our friends use. This is a $20 Sony EMC lapel mic. I have three of these. I have one for my wireless setup. I have one for my camera for YouTube. And I have one for my smartphone. That's how good this is and how I stand by it because it's $25, and it works. If you got $25, bucks, you have got crystal clear audio. This is the same audio for $25 bucks in my YouTube videos. So that's perfect audio. 
plug that into your phone, get like a $6 like selfie stick thing or spot pop 25 for the mini one that I use when I'm on vacation. And all of a sudden your video quality is better than the first 100 videos of the top people in YouTube when they got started. Understanding that and understanding that your authenticity, your on-screen performance, your ability to relate to your audience, your ability to be authentic, replying to your commenters, even if it's 10 of them, um, matters. Do that first. Then learn the editing and learn how does this make this editing make my thing better? Because now people like they I've gotten used to it. It's me, it's this, it's that. The most important thing is to get the information or get the content or get whatever you're doing out there. That's the most important thing. After that, production comes later. We still watch very poorly produced and edited movies from the 80s today because the story is interesting enough and the performances are fantastic. Yeah, it's actually interesting you mentioned about the intros and all the extra fluff that some people think they need. And actually, they lose viewers more than they gain viewers because they don't get to the content. And it's actually more of a myth that all those fancy little decorations that they add on to their video, actually, people don't have patience for, right? People just want the content then and there. And so their best bet is, is to actually, in the beginning, not go towards adding all those fancy things and just focus on the content and not focus on... And then upfront value, exactly. People, can, people like seeing you grow. When people go back and they watch my earliest YouTube videos, they realize he's he's got the same message. He really is consistent. Mm -hmm. Like when I just dabbled in like YouTube, like six years ago where I would go like two years without posting anything, right? Uh, and then if I did, it might be like posting, hey, this is like, you know, an impromptu thing that's happening in the middle of New York or whatever. So, like. When I was doing that, like even when I was getting on camera six years ago and I was like, oh, well, this about design or this mm -hmm. about typography or whatever, they realized that messaging was consistent. My comfort level, the gap between now and then, huge. Even the gap between my comfort level on camera two years ago, huge. Mm -hmm. So consistency matters. And if I had started being consistent and putting stuff out there and getting on camera more even back then, like the gap would be even bigger. And even when you watch someone big like Gary Vee, like I went back and I literally uh, in the last like year have watched all 1000 episodes of Wine Library TV that are still available on YouTube. And I watched, it took about 30 episodes of Wine Library TV for him to get super comfortable. And then it took about maybe 60 for him to start getting loud and be his energetic self mm -hmm. instead of trying to be formal and coming off awkward. So you would never know that about Gary today, but the the transformation i saw the progress and that was interesting to me and that's why i go back to watch some of these old youtubers even the ones whose content i wouldn't normally watch just to make the point to people and say look go back and if you are a beauty blogger if you are a tech guru if you are whatever your thing is if you're going to be a vlogger or you're going to be a fitness person go back and watch this person's start i think so many people get obsessed with the, the Tyler Oakleys and the PewDiePies, and I have nothing against those people, but they're sitting there and they're not realizing it's like, that's not meant to be you. Not everyone's going to be Michael Jordan, okay? Not everybody is going to be Venus Williams. Not everybody is going to be, you know, whoever, okay? You have to be you. Run your race, but take tactics and look at how someone built themselves from nothing, and then you do that. So I want to I want to interject there, Roberto, and address something that we were actually talking about in the in the pre-show around influence and social media influencers. So Joshua Johnson here dropped a comment a little earlier on saying, unlike most, Roberto gives practical steps, not just talking in the abstract. So not just talking out of rhetoric, which so many people, especially in social media, seem to do. So have we really entered a generation where being a social media influencer is the end game? Because it seems you keep hearing this term influencer and, you know, people saying that they aspire to be a social media influencer. So let's talk about that for a moment. Within your realm, how do you like to be addressed as a title or for your background? And how do you personally define influence? I like to be addressed as Roberto because I'm unique. I like to like I wouldn't even mind if people just say, "Oh, hey, that's the create awesome guy," right? Because I, I built that you know that brand for a reason. Like 
uh, because that's what I do. That's what I execute on is like, I create awesome things and share them with the world. I help other people do that. I educate and motivate them. Cool. If they wanted to say, oh, well, that's, you know, um, that's Roberto. That's that, you know, creative pro or, oh, you know, that's um, Roberto. I read his writing mm -hmm. or, oh, that's Roberto. I watch his stuff. I'm fine with that. Like I haven't, like, as far as how I'm defined, I really literally just want it to be that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to become Roberto Blake. That if I was going to say anything, I'm right. trying to become Roberto Blake, where that in itself is the context of who I am and that that actually means something. And that's not egotistical. It's about legacy. It's about the fact that I want to know that I help that many people execute. And in a lot of specialized areas, that's already true. And I found that out. I didn't know. I believe it or not, I did not know. Someone in my community actually had to tell me that, mm. no, that's a thing. I talked to this person that I was going to about a job interview, and mm. I brought up your name, and they immediately knew who I, who I was talking about. I was like, okay, that's weird to me because I don't see that when I look in the mirror. I'm trying to get to a point where, one, I see that in the mirror. I know that, and I know I made that level of a difference. I got into this game to initially help people. But helping people also transformed into how do I change the culture of creative services and make it kind of suck less? Because my career, I had to deal with some really crappy people. How do I change mm -hmm. that culture? Wow, some really unfair expectations are being made of people uh, in their job roles and they're being asked to do too much. How do I influence that? Or if I can't, how do I enable people to be capable of executing on that? So when we talk about the social media thing and the marketers, like, some people refer to me as a YouTuber, and that is part of who I am. I don't mm -hmm. like the phrase YouTuber in terms of what it is becoming culturally. Like you said, people aspire to do that, but they don't have a – when I ask them why, why do you want – Yeah, they, they, they aspire point? to be the next Shea Carl because of the associated fame that potentially comes yeah. with it. Vanity. We talk about vanity metrics. It's the vanity metrics. I'm like – why do you need more subscribers? And then here's the other thing. It's emotional social proof for them in terms of if this many people are listening, then I'm doing it right. That's a lack of confidence that's very disheartening to me because I'm like, I tell people I have a video coming out tomorrow. I have a video coming out tomorrow about how to get more YouTube subscribers. You know, the first minute and a half, I actually don't give any actual advice for the first minute and a half. I make up for it in the gold that I give in the last five minutes of that seven minute video. <laughs> you know why I do that? Because I point out that before social media ever existed, for like 20 years, I was doing things because I thought they were awesome and because I wanted to grow. And for those first 20 years, like before 10 years ago, you or I could do something. And if five people praised this for us, that was a good day. That was a good yeah. month because there was no way to get social validation instantly like that. And right. no one – I drew in my sketchbook. Do you realize how many hundreds of thousands of drawings I probably did and doodles I probably did that I never got a thumbs up on in my life? So when someone gives up or says, I'm not going to do a video anymore right. because I'm not getting any views or I'm not getting – or I only got 100 views, I'm like, what the hell? Because – and I mean, I usually don't go that far, but I'm like, literally, I'm thinking about it now. I'm getting riled up because I'm like, how dare you not respect your abilities or your talent enough to where 100 people is not important to you in terms of you respecting that 100 people gave you their time and are saying good job or at least interested in what you're doing. 100 human beings is a lot, and it mm -hmm. matters. And you're saying that all of those people – even up till now, who bet on you? If your parents like said, oh, go ahead and do that thing and we bought you a camera or that they said, okay, like even if they don't understand it, all right, I'm going to cheer you on. And then for you to say, okay, it's been two months. I'm not a big YouTuber yet. I give up. Oh, I spent my whole summer on that. I didn't get a thousand subscribers. I give up. Oh, you know what? I need to cheat and I need to do sub for sub or buy views or do like for like because then at least if I see that number, I'll feel so good about what I'm doing that I'll keep doing it. Like, no. It's yeah, it's it's all it's all, you know, perception is reality, right? But there's something that I've I've said for years now, which oftentimes gets overlooked. I'm gonna address a comment that was made here just a couple of minutes ago, but it's documented success. You cannot fake success. And what is success? Results. And I'm sorry, results is not just a vanity metric. So we have a comment here that uh, from someone that says that they would welcome and embrace the term influencer 
over guru because an influencer, you have to have the chops and display your ba- your brain trust and mind share, not fake it. But I disagree with that. I think today the term oh, influencer has been associated with those vanity metrics of following. And I'm I'm sorry, let's let's address the elephant in the room. Anyone can buy followers. Anyone can have any number, but can you actually produce results? So when I look at someone like yourself, Roberto, I see someone that's actually created over 600 pieces of content. I'm sorry, you cannot fake that. Whether you you took one day to record a video for 24 hours and chopped it up into several short videos, you cannot fake creating content. You cannot fake creating awesome. So that's where I draw the line in the sand and say, there's two things that have to occur here. One, sweat equity. So you got to put in the time. If you put in the time over a period of time, you're going to have that that funnel or that snowball effect where things are going to come together. But you got to be consistent, which is a word that you've said many times and I love it. The, so besides sweat equity, it's documented success. And if you put in the sweat equity, you put in the documented success, that doesn't make you an influencer. That makes you knowledgeable. So again, I think we need to go back to addressing Okay, that the term influencer is one that I personally hope goes away next year. I think whether you have five people that you influence at your church or in your neighborhood or in your community or five million that you influence online, influence is influence. Okay, it's just different scale and different mediums. Right. I think that it comes back to something we talked about. And like, you know, like yesterday in our conversation, Juan Juan Saba, we talked about this. It's, it always comes back to the why. It comes back to the motivation behind what your actions are. And are your actions mapping to the thing that you say you want? Something Gary Vaynerchuk talks about all the time. And the thing is, I bring him up and I quote him a lot. Not because Roberto, I really appreciate all these Gary Vaynerchuk. <laughs> no, and, and, and I want to say, Comments. Gary's someone that I look up to yeah. a lot. And... Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to kind of go in a different direction. But Gary's a great role model he for is. a lot of us out there because Gary has the charisma, but he's also created a path that it's very easy to emulate and follow that. And, and so many times we hear from people in our circles, "I want to be the next Gary Vaynerchuk," instead of people saying, "I want to be the person that was put on this earth and destined to be." With Gary Vaynerchuk being a great role model or someone to exactly. emulate and learn from. Exactly. It's like how I said, I'm trying to become Roberto Blake so that we can, you know, contextually one day there will be someone who says like Roberto Blake was the person who mentored me in X, Y, Z, which some people are currently saying, but like, I want to have that. It's not, oh, Roberto is the next Gary Vaynerchuk. It's like, no, that would actually bum me out that like, I mean, not because of the association with Gary, but would like that I didn't have my own thing. You know, right. that would actually be very devastating to me to not have my own thing rather than, oh, you're just like person X, Y, Z. Yeah. And that's something ahead, we Sam. actually, yeah, no, you're totally right. And that's something we talk about in the other show I do, Creative Nation. We talk a lot about the fine line between imitation and inspiration, right? You shouldn't imitate anyone, right? None of us want to be imitating Gary Vaynerchuk because we're, you know, Carlos, Saba, and Roberto. But we, what we do want to be doing is be inspired by not just one person, but multiple people. And so we talk a lot about that. I want to shift the conversation a little bit towards um, maybe the people that are not being super successful and why and sort of what mistakes. I know you put out a really, really great Medium article that I actually skimmed through. And there was about, you wrote actually 50 different mistakes that you see people on YouTube making. And I'm sure you constantly get um, people writing on comments on your videos. Hey, you know what? I did this and it didn't work, right? Because I know that one part of your YouTube channel is about growing your following. And I know you and I were talking and you said, you know, I usually go back and I see that that thing hasn't been done. And so if you want to just outline maybe the top five things that people are doing wrong and that they easily do wrong and how they can fix those things. Right. So whether you're a personal brand or you're a business and you're on YouTube, the odds are you might be making one of these five mistakes. And believe it or not, I've, I'm not calling anyone out. I have seen people who've reached out to me who are literally, they have seven figure and eight figure businesses. And I had to help them address some of these things. I'm not kidding. And I'm not going to name names, not because of not name dropping, but I'm also not going to call anyone out. I'm not the type to call anyone out on something they just weren't aware that they were doing wrong for the sake of that. I would do that one-on-one and help them fix it as I constantly do. 
But these things, these five things out of the 50 are probably the most devastating things that people are doing. Aside from, you know, the hacks with sub for sub and buying stuff, I won't go into that. These are the five. Number one, they're not making it very clear to their audience what the value proposition is for them in terms of delivering that upfront value. They're not doing that. And I can go specific in a lot of ways. The next thing is that that's not being clear when they land on the channel in terms of the visual branding. The visual branding is not there just to look pretty and to be interesting. You know, even initially, I would say I initially didn't even do that right. Call myself out on that, right? Nobody else. I went back and addressed that specifically. And even today, I'm actually um, helping my intern team. I'm doing a photo shoot to even go back and make my thumbnails even better because the visual branding matters and consistency matters. So now I'm actually going to build a system for the templates to just make them always be like 110% better than anything else that shows up in a search so that someone says, you know what, out of all the videos here, I see this one might have had the most effort put behind it. So the impression that the visual branding of your channel has is one of the most devastating mistakes that people are making because it also says, is this person going to stick around? Is this person taking this seriously? Or is this a hobby to them or a joke or a gimmick? Like, how serious are they? Optics like that matter even more than social proof or vanity. They matter a lot more because something like, you'd be like, if something doesn't look right and then you see it's successful, it's like you question it then. You're skeptical of why it does that have there's something wrong here. And you may or may not watch it, but that doesn't mean you'll convert to a subscriber. The other third thing that people um, don't do is they don't have an investment strategy behind their channel, meaning they don't know what their channel's goals are going to be in terms of to invest back into them as a human being, them as a business. They also don't have a plan to invest into their audience as far as what value they're going to give. And they don't have a plan in how to scale the channel's quality in terms of the video production, the editing. They don't have any strategy for that. And they're not aligning their monetization goals to any of this. You actually need an investment plan behind your channel and not just from a business standpoint, in the same way that as if you were an athlete, and I go back to this because I was a track runner, that I had to invest in my shoes, I had to invest, uh, invest in my meals, my water, my time in terms of knowing my rest time versus my workout times. You have to have a strategy for that. I have a strategy for the production of my videos to get out seven days a week is not me showing up and shooting a video here in my office every single day. It's me knowing that I will give an hour and I will shoot eight videos that now have the Monday graphic design videos for the next two months done. It's me saying, okay, the YouTube videos are going to be longer to do to cover certain things. Okay, cool. I will shoot these five videos for the month and Fridays for the month are done. That's another hour, maybe not even in the same day. And then all of a sudden you take six hours and two months of footage is in the can. Now I have editing to do at 15 minutes of pop tops. I know exactly how many videos I have to edit um, in a week to have the week covered in advance or to say, you know what, I'm just going to edit all the graphic design videos for a month, upload them all, schedule them, release, done, or whatever it is. So having a investment strategy, having a production strategy, number three, the visual branding and optics, knowing your why. And then I would say the next thing that people don't do is they don't know how to ask for what they want. They are so afraid to do it and they don't, even when they're not afraid, they don't know how to do it properly. At the end of every one of my videos, I ask people to like this video if you like it. Don't forget to subscribe. Check out the other awesome content on the channel. As always, you guys, thanks so much for watching and don't forget, create something awesome today. That is literally my outro to pretty much every video. And I know that cold, but it's also a ritual that one, there are people who tell me they stay to the end to hear the inspirational message of create something awesome today. They like the video because I reminded them that they can engage in that way. Before I ever get to that closeout where I'm asking for that, subscribe, I tell people in the middle of the video that, you know what, if you have questions on this thing, hey, make sure you hit me up in the comment section below. And the thing is, if they've ever watched a video of mine, they know I reply to everyone. But if they don't, I usually say, hey, make sure you hit me in the comments. I actually try to respond to as many of them as I can. So then I'm setting the expectation that if you challenge me and you write me a comment, there's a very heavy chance. There's probably a 9 out of 10 chance that I will respond. And if you don't do it, if I don't respond to this video and I don't respond today, I might get to it in two or three days uh, because I will sit there and I will comb through videos that um, in my phone on the YouTube app that I haven't replied to while I'm in line at the bank or getting Starbucks coffee. 
I'm going to lose that time regardless. So I'm going to give it back to my audience. I'm making an investment in my audience. I'm committing to the engagement and I'm setting them up for the engagement of, Hey, challenge me. If I, if you, if you comment, I will reply, you know, and if you comment and you just want to say, well, you sound blah, 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 or I don't like your haircut. I'm just going to delete you or ban you. And I tell people that I'm just upfront about it. And I ask for the engagement. I say, I would like you to subscribe, but they also know at that point what's in it for them. I don't have to reiterate with that. You know, I told them there's other content on the channel. They look just like, oh crap, there's a hundred videos on graphic design. There's 160 videos on graphic design. Oh, there's 75 videos on growing a YouTube channel. I can just sit here and binge through. And then I get the comments back. Wow, I just binge through this. And now I understand this. Uh, that question I asked, never mind. You did a video. I caught it, you know? So those are the five things. It's, you know, do that. And other than that, reference my Medium article on 100 tips to grow your YouTube channel. And that's only the top 10% of what I could say about it. And that is some real talk. So Roberto, before we move on to this final segment, for those of us that are watching you here on Blab, for one, you just dropped some straight fire, my man. So go ahead and dust your shoulder off for that. But we cannot see you. So if you could refresh your browser, we might be able to see you. Oh. <laughs> But now everything, yeah, everything, everything, Saba and those of you that are listening, everything that Roberto just said is spot on. You know, YouTube is one of those mediums that's often overlooked in marketing, and for so much talk that the Facebooks and Twitters and Instagrams of the world get. There we go, Roberto. We see you again. So for as much love and attention as the social networks get, the more mainstream ones, people lose sight of the fact that YouTube, it's the second most searched website online behind Google. And ironically, Google owns YouTube. So if anything else, look at YouTube as a powerful content marketing hub. Again, at, to your point, your videos, Roberto, you can share them on social media. YouTube makes it really easy to, to share your content out on all the major social networks. You can even share out on Pinterest. If you want to, you can embed your YouTube videos on medium within your own website, within your own blog. So it's such a versatile platform yet so often overlooked. So I really appreciate Roberto, your, your five tips there. Now, before we wrap up this episode, of social 45, you were recently featured in Forbes magazine around your strategy for, for scaling, for growing. You've talked over the last hour about creating over 600 videos over a period now of a little over two years. So drop maybe three tips at the highest level for anyone that is watching this or listening and is either getting started on YouTube or is currently on YouTube, but kind of going through some struggles. What would you say, again, speaking from the info that you gave in Forbes, what would be some of your, your top tips? All right. So uh, top tips. And by the way, bringing up the Forbes feature, um, specifically, they featured the fact that in the year, this year, I tripled my subscriber base because I actually went from, um, I think in February, 20,000, I hit 20,000 in February. I scaled that to um, over 60,000 by the time the article went out and I'm on the way to 70 now. So what I would say are my top tips there definitely are, you don't have to do the volume of content that I did. Um, I actually could have gotten more subscribers and grown even bigger and possibly even quicker if I had done less content, went niche instead of broad. And I, I swear mm -hmm. this is true. And this is why I tell people, run their own race. Don't take my strategy and my tactics. Don't go and do what Roberto did of seven days a week of different content. Do not do that. Be smarter, I think. Start with one day a week. Do two videos a week when you can, three when you can, and cut off there, or even bulk shoot on a weekend or a week. Put out 20 or 30 solid, amazing pieces of content that you're comfortable with and that you've edited to perfection, and then market them very effectively in the context of your audience and your niche. So I would say that's what consistency looks like, and that's my number one tip is consistency is not doing what Roberto did. And making seven videos, you know, for the past like year, doing seven uh, days a week of videos and everything like that. Consistency is knowing who your audience is, what you're here to do, why you're here to do it, how it aligns to your business goals, how it aligns to you philosophically, how you're consistently authentic. 
I don't put on a mask and put on an act and put on a character so that I can just show up and turn on a camera. It makes it really easy frictionlessly for me to be consistent. So I would say find that for you and make whatever amount of content you're comfortable with. And if it's one video a week is what represents consistency to you, then yes. If it's releasing a series all at once and marketing it, that is consistent because now it's consistent quality, consistent content, consistent optics, and a consistent marketing message and a consistent value that you're demonstrating. So a company or a business or even an individual that does a limited series of 10, 20, 30 videos a year can be successful and grow just on marketing those videos and building a community around it and answering all the questions and comments that go with those 10 or 20 videos that might be more manageable. I have to answer 5,000 comments a month. Uh, now I've figured out a way to do it myself, one man band, but that might not be sustainable. So consistency is about what is sustainable and what is scalable for you. So consistency is that first nugget that I'll give. And then the second one that I'll give is show up as your authentic self. Just like I talk about in the mini guide that you get on the email list, the seven points of personal branding. And I'll leave a link so people can get that. But, um, or you can just go robertoblake.com slash newsletter and you can sign up for the Create Awesome Community um, newsletter, Create Awesome People, and you will get that free ebook once you confirm your email address. I bring that up because we buy and we engage with and we interact with people we like. I'm on this show because yes. I like both of you, you know, and it's a good show. But <laughs> well, I we like, like you too. guys. So I'm here. And then I would hope that there are people who are here because they like you guys and maybe they like right. me. So you, you engage with people that you like the most. You spend time with people you like the most. And now I put myself in a position where people can spend time with me every day if they want to. So show up, be authentic, spend time. Make sure that people are buying into the authentic you because unless you're going to be an actor, it's really hard to sustain and to show up and feel motivated to do a video however often you're going to do it if you're not enjoying it and you're not being real. So you should be doing YouTube, not necessarily for the money or the fame or the vanity metrics, mm -hmm. but because this is something that you're comfortable with and that you like and that you can get the value out of. Look, we all talk about video marketing being the game now. Video marketing, I would argue that there are some businesses that would be better for them to do a podcast because that's who the, their brand is and that's who their market is. Uh, I don't think that they need to do video. I know that John Lee Dumas has a YouTube channel and it's a smaller channel by far compared to his podcast audience because that's where he started and that's who he is. And it's not to say he's bad at video or YouTube at all. He's not. But there's a reason that he's more successful at podcasting than at video marketing. So be authentic. Don't try to be Gary Vaynerchuk. Don't try to be Freddie Wong. Don't try to be PewDiePie. Don't try to be Michelle Phan. Don't try to be uh, Marquez Brownlee. Don't try to be Roberto Blake. Show up and be you. And that's important. So then final nugget, what do I want to do? Should I do something that's like a personal thing for people or should I do business? What's the third one? What should I do? Let's do personal. Okay. So one of the big things you have to worry about in YouTube is criticism. It will not always be constructive. Not everyone will be a fan and it's okay. And you can choose um, whether or not um, to, you know, take the advice of hug your haters or not. Um, I do and I don't. Um, if you define your haters as your critics, that's one thing. But haters who are there to literally just hate, shake them off. And don't just shake them off. If you actually have the opportunity, it's not a lot of effort maybe shove them into traffic. I don't know, but like, that's a little dark. But um, what I will say is put yourself in a position to where you still feel comfortable doing what you're doing and don't allow anyone to rob you of the joy of whatever you're creating or whatever you're putting out there and focus on the people that you're creating value for and do that. And, you know, in that way, I would say that I have to identify what criticism looks like and constructive criticism. Um, I actually meant to share this in the uh, social media masterminds group earlier from my own page. Um, and constructive criticism is accurate, actionable advice. If someone is criticizing you, understand that they or may not be a critic in the sense that a critic should be qualified, meaning that they have enough expertise and executions to speak to this thing intelligently in a way that builds you up and puts you in a position to execute on being better. See, constructive criticism is constructive, build up, build. 
not tear down, destroy. So constructive means they have to be, they don't have to be cheerleading you, but they do have to have a positive intention toward you of improvement, regardless of how it presents. And then um, it could even be tough love, but it has to really be love. It can't be hate. So it has to, it can't be, oh, I just don't like this or I just don't like you. It has to be, here's something you can do that will help you achieve this if that is your intention and your goal, which means they have to have the accurate understanding of what you're trying to do, which is part of being a critic and being educated enough to make those connections and see what, oh, I see what you were trying to do. Here's where I feel you may have felt short based on this evidence. Here is things that people have done to successfully have done and what I would recommend to you. And it has to be that advice, meaning it's something you can take or leave that I think would be of value to you. Not if you don't do what I say, then you just don't have a thick skin or you're soft or whatever. It can't be pejorative. So understand that you will get people who don't understand that nuance of triple A, accurate, actionable advice. And if they're not qualified to speak on what you're doing or they don't know what your goals are, then you don't listen to them. I don't listen to the people who don't know that mm -hmm. a million views on a video doesn't matter to me or to my business because if it doesn't make me a million dollars, I don't care. <laughs> you know, I need it. And I don't need every video to make me a million dollars. And it's not to say they have, I need one person who can move the needle on what I want to accomplish to uh, watch that video. Or more importantly, I need the 100 people who watch that video to be able to tell me that 10 of them actioned on it and it worked and it made a difference in their life or their business, their career or their job. So that's my intention. Someone who thinks that I'm a YouTuber first will look at views and will criticize me on views. And then I correct them in the sense of for the rest of people who do matter in that regard that I need, or even for them, because I'm not saying they don't matter, but I'm saying by themselves, they don't um, in this context. Right. I need people to understand that I am not a YouTuber first. I'm a creative first slash businessman. And then I am those other things second or foremost, I'm a human being first. I'm someone that, you know, if you don't like me, you don't have to be rude about it. You know, haters get hate, man. There's first. always going to be, there's right. always gonna be critics in the corner, man. So haters going to hate. You got to do haters you, be you. you. And shake exactly. Off. Just shake it off. Roberto, we are at time. We want to thank you for coming on to social 545. If you don't mind, we typically do a little bit of an after show here on Blab. So if you got a few minutes, we'd love yeah, to hang around. For those that are either watching us here on Blab or listening to us on iTunes, where can they find you? So if you guys want to find me on YouTube, you can find me at youtube.com slash Roberto Blake two, as in the number two. Um, if you want to actually reach out to me and you want help with video marketing or your personal brand, I do offer paid consultation and you can reach out to me at rblake at robertoblake.com. If you are a fan of social 545, I will offer you a special discount. So be sure to mention that or name drop Carlos and Saba and I will hook you up. So go ahead and feel free to do that. If you guys want the free mini book, the seven points of personal branding mini guide, which will help you be authentic in your messaging, whether it's YouTube, your podcast, your website, whatever you're trying to do with your personal brand, I break down the things that help me find my philosophy and retain being philosophical, cons uh, sorry, philosophically consistent to this day. And that's in there. So you can get that at robertoblake.com slash newsletter. And that is my free gift to you. Awesome. That's really great. I mean, I know that you moved the needle for me, and I'm sure that you've moved the needle for all the listeners that we have. So Carlos and I want to thank you for joining us, dropping all the knowledge that you do. Please keep creating so we have more videos to watch and more to learn from you. Uh, with that, we are signing off with Social 545. Thanks, everyone. And remember, create something awesome today. Yes. <laughs>